producing the next four lectures. Um, this first lecture, which I was asked to talk about, was uh, about black holes. Um, and I'm going to talk about them in a fairly limited context in this lecture, although they will come up in, in two more of the lectures. Um, I should start at the beginning and say that a lot of my work um, has been done in collaboration over 40 or 50 years. And here are some of the uh, collaborators I have had emphasizing the, the more recent ones, I suppose. Um, and uh, I'm grateful for, for all of them, uh, but I do not, uh, they should not feel um, uh, implicated in some of the more radical things I will say. And in that connection, in preparing these five lectures, I should emphasize, start now, I suppose, with what in the United States is called a government health warning. Um, I will try and give you a, a, a fair and balanced view of some interesting and I think current scientific issues and problems. Um, and in each case, I'm actually going to go a little bit off the standard path and introduce some uh, radical or heretical, depending on how you look at this, uh, notions uh, of other, way, other ways to think about these problems. So I'll try and make clear where I am uh, talking about the consensus and where I'm not, but it will be a feature of all five of these lectures in practice. Okay, so um, let me go on to the next uh, slide, and I'm going to talk about black holes, and there are many images I could show here. Um, I'll, I'll just start from the top left-hand corner. I have here a, sorry, a cursor. Can you see a, a black arrow? Does yes. Come across? yes, we can. Excellent. Sometimes it doesn't. So thank you. So here are uh, a, 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 a eight pictures in the, if you like, in the history of black holes. And there are many more pictures I could show there, but these are the eight I've got room for. This is John Mit Mitchell, an English polymath in the 18th century, who sort of asked the question, well, what happened if we had, if we made the sun so small that light would not have the escape velocity from its surface? He asked that question, Laplace did a little bit later. And in some sense, he was the first person to uh, sort of put on the table the notion that there might be black holes out there. Here is Karl Schwarzschild, who at the time was a German soldier in the, in the First World War, just before, actually, um, and just before he died, he received a copy, in fact, it was almost a draft copy, of Einstein's paper where he eventually got to the full equations of general relativity, the field equations, and Schwarzschild did something that Einstein could have done but didn't, which was seek a spherically symmetric solution, particularly for thinking about what implications it might have for the solar system. And so he did this in a way, an implicit buried in this solution is the notion that something happens at the same radius that Mitchell had identified where the escape velocity in a Newtonian sense of a particle of light is going to, um, is going, is going to be the speed of that particle. Now, this uh, actually showed up in Schwarzschild's equations, or in fact, in a modern version of them, as an apparent singularity. And for many years, the, this radius, this special radius where the escape velocity is the speed of light, is, uh, was called, sometimes called the Schwarzschild singularity. But uh, wise people, uh, including Enten, especially in, uh, because I have a special affection for his memory, uh, Georges Lemaitre, um, although he was primarily a cosmologist, he was interested in many other things. And, and he also got the notion that this so-called Schwarzschild singularity was nothing of the kind. It was only a, a defect of the coordinate system, like going to the South Pole, where people work quite happily without being ripped apart. And it was, there was nothing special that happened to the geometry of space-time in that region. And he, he was one of the people who, in the 1920s, 1930s, who realized was this was the case. Others did not, do, were actually rather confused about the point for another 30 years, in some cases. Uh, uh, Robert Oppenheimer next, and he, um, uh, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Robert Oppenheimer, he also thought about how a black hole might form through gravitational collapse. And I think he, he and um, 
uh, his, his student Schneider actually understood the kinematics of this rather well, although again, it was underappreciated what they'd done till much later. Um, then we sprint leap forward to 1963 when Roy Kerr, a New Zealand mathematician working at that time in the United States, um, found another solution to Einstein's equations, a generalization, if you like, of Schwarzschild's solution. And this describes a spinning space time that is asymptotically flat. And here's a modern version of his famous metric. It's not the one he worked with. It was a miracle of applied mathematics that he did this. And to say it's a miracle looked like it's some sort of chance. No, it wasn't. It was a very uh, inspired mathematician using all the tools of his craft to do what he set himself out to do. And by God, he succeeded. It was a wonderful accomplishment. And, um, and it, it came in the same time as the first really good evidence that black holes existed in the cosmos, although that connection was not made for many years. Um, next is John Wheeler, who uh, recognized the importance of relativistic astrophysics and in some sense led a school in the United States. And he also coined the phrase black hole Although it wasn't, in fact, for the first time, there was an Australian journalist called Anne Ewing who had used this, this phrase beforehand, but I think his coinage was original, and he wrote an essay entitled Introducing the Black Hole, and in some sense put, put the whole subject on the map. Then two more people who also need no introduction, really Stephen Hawking, uh, one of a group of then very young um, researchers in general relativity who completely transformed the way of thinking about strong field relativity, uh, black holes, and also cosmology. And then Roger Penrose here, uh, and I'll come to his contribution in a moment. Um, and then, of course, towering over all of these is Albert Einstein, uh, whose 10 year quest from special relativity to general relativity was a wonderful intellectual adventure with many wrong turns and misconceptions and so on. But he got there in the end and everything that he produced in 1950, we've no reason to doubt that it is correct. Now, in the particular context of black holes, I would say um, that he, Einstein himself was not, <clears throat> not as forward looking as other people. And in fact, he got a bit confused like many other people about what was going on in the context of a black hole. And probably underlying this was a very responsible fear. And I, I suspect there should be a Greek word for this. It's called fear of the singularity, because as Penrose and, and, and others uh, demonstrated, it was unavoidable that the formation of a black hole would be accompanied by the formation of a region where classical time comes to an end and classical relativity essentially breaks up in genuine singularities, genuine um, problems with things you can measure in your head at least. Um, and the only saving grace is that there's a thing called the cosmic censorship uh, hypothesis. It's really a conjecture and it's all, it, in to, it, to all practical purposes, it's strongly believed to be the true, which is that although these singularities are there, uh, we are all very respectable, and, um, and astronomers at least are very respectable, I should say, and they uh, draw a curtain around the singularity called the event horizon, and we can't actually see what's going on in the singularity. That appears to be the case observationally. We've got very good reasons numerically and theoretically for believing it in practical circumstances, uh, but it doesn't stop it being A, an interesting uh, exercise for mathematicians to firm up what's going on, and B, a, a playground for the febrile imaginations um, uh, of theoretical physicists, uh, uh, who have uh, no, no such bourgeois sensibilities, and they're not in the, not in the least um, afraid to draw away the curtain and see what might be going on behind it. And I, I just noticed in your program that my colleague here at Stanford, called coincidentally Douglas Stanford, um, who once actually worked for me as an undergraduate, is giving you a talk on the very much on the theoretical physics side of this. And what I'm going to emphasize in this talk is astronomy and what we actually see uh, and ha have, a, have a real view of, of exists out there. So without further ado, I'm going to do a very fast pr primer on black holes from a very classical point of view. And so I put everything on one dense slide here. Much of this will be familiar. I'm 
I'm told I'm talking to a physics audience, so uh, things that I would otherwise explain should I will not do so. But please feel free to ask questions if I'm assuming um, uh, things that are not not sort of fairly well known. Firstly, as I've emphasised, black holes are um, are observed. We see them in two main classes in abundance. Firstly, we see stellar black holes, and we've seen these since, well, we've identified them since the early 1970s, uh, and we know many express cases. They're typically between three and 150 times the, the mass of the sun uh, in terms of observations. And there's probably a million of these, maybe slightly more, maybe slightly less in our galaxy alone. Um, and so they're really terribly common in the universe. It's not an an occasional exotic thing, it's a natural endpoint of stellar evolution. In this talk, I'll be talking more about the massive black holes. They are a million to 10 billion solar masses, uh, and they exist in most reasonable galaxies, including our own, and one in particular that I'm going to uh, emphasize in this talk. There are also intermediate black holes which have intermediate masses between those two classes, and we have some evidence that they're present, but I'm not going to say any more about them, but there is some evidence that that they've been observed, but far from compelling. And then finally, there's, there's the theoretical physicist type of black hole, which is very exciting. Um, the idea that there's primordial black holes, perhaps low mass black holes in which quantum mechanics plays a major role, unlike the ones I'm talking about. Uh, there's absolutely no observational evidence for this outside the febrile imaginings of theoretical physicists, but they have been a real touchstone for theoretical physics and they forced all of us to think about problems that have that have had interesting and important answers. Now, the 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 black hole, the spinning black space time described by Roy Kerr, has essentially just two parameters. One is a scale, that's just the mass, and the other is its spin, which we can characterize in several equivalent ways. And we'll I'm going to characterize this in terms of a single parameter. I'm going to call A, which is going to live between minus one and one, this parameter, and it, it measures the spin of the black hole, and it's a black hole that, that obeys cosmic censorship and so on. You can't spin up a black hole to make A greater than, than one, for example. Um, these quantities, the mass and the spin, can in the thought experiment be measured by a, a distant planet, measuring using Kepler's laws, or a gyro, which will slowly process in response to the spin. And so this is a well-defined um, definition of the spin, and uh, I'll just say it here that momentum, mass, energy, um, uh, and angular momentum, and so on, are all can all be defined in a way that is completely conservative after the after processes are finished, and so on. If you take account of all the, all the contributors, and so May, um... question is there a question. No, just, just, okay, just uh, comment. Okay, great. Um, so uh, going on, the mass is a scale, and this is sometimes called the gravitational radius, GM over C squared, half the so-called Schwarzschild radius, associated that with a time and energy and other quantities you can define. So these are just scales. The mass is just a simple scale. And the spin, as I've said, is described by this, the angular momentum, there's a formula for it there. The event horizon, which I think is a totally familiar concept. It's the surface, if you like. It's actually a volume, but in three-dimensional volume, if you like, but it, it, for all purposes that we need, it's essentially a two-dimensional surface. And um, it's given by that formula there in terms of the gravitational radius. And uh, there's an angular velocity associated with the black hole given by the formula that, that I have here. The black hole itself has an area. You can define that quite happily as, a, as an area of a two-dimensional surface given by this formula here. And a very important theorem that I will come back to, uh, presented by, proven originally by Stephen Hawking, is that in classical relativity, this the area of this event horizon must increase. And I, I, I was a student at the time when they were doing this work, and it was, uh, it was incorporated, this sort of must increase sounds rather like entropy, and it was included initially as an analogy with the first law of thermodynamics with a sort of TDS term where the T is essentially the surface gravity. As I say, it was originally thought of as an entropy, but as now everyone I'm sure in the, in the 
on the call knows um, this is this is not an analogy, it's a real thing. There is an entropy associated with the surface of the black hole and correspondingly it has a temperature and it can radiate as Stephen Hawking also showed. Again, not a concern for me here, except the fact that the area will increase, which I will mention in a moment. So this fact that the area increases means that it can't decrease and the best you can do in a thermodynamic sense is a reversible process that will <clears throat> Ch change the mass of a black hole, keeping its area constant. And this difference between the minimum mass that a black hole must have to keep its area constant and the, um, and the mass it actually has is an energy which is a rotational energy. And this is a, like a rotational kinetic energy that one would associate with a top. And here's an expression for it here. And the, and the point is that in principle, this energy is is extractable and my central thesis here is that it is actually being extracted. Now, if we go on to talk about these spinning black holes described by the, by, by the curve space time, then a very important property that they have is, what's, is that they have a region around them outside the event horizon, therefore accessible to us, called the ergosphere. And this is a region in which uh, a, a, a mythical observer or a, a rock or a star or whatever you want, or a particle if you like, has to orbit with respect to distant uh, objects. And so it has, sorry, it is, has to orbit. And um, that uh, dragging of inertial frames, as it's called, uh, has some very peculiar consequences. As Roger Penrose first pointed out, it means that there are orbits inside the ergosphere and confined to the ergosphere that have negative total energy. In the Newtonian language, that would be uh, rest mass plus kinetic energy minus gravitational potential energy, but relativity, it's all the same thing. And uh, that can be negative. So that means if one of those particles on the negative energy orbit goes into the event horizon, it will um, extract energy mass from the black hole. And it's a generalization of that idea that uh, I shall be talking about further in this talk. That, that particular, these sort of putting particles onto negative energy orbit turns out to be rather ineffectual. Uh, I think most of us agree, and I'll show you another way of doing this that may be more effective. Okay, now I want to segue from that sort of far too rapid um, introduction to the theory of black holes in general relativity to uh, talk about the Event Horizon Telescope. And this is a network, uh, not the first by a long way, this has been going on since the 1960s, of telescopes that essentially do interferometry using the whole Earth as a baseline and therefore getting an angular resolution of lambda over the radius of the Earth. And if you make lambda as small as millimeter wavelengths, as they do with the event horizon telescopes, then you get a truly impressive resolution and can start seeing the region around a black hole. And that's what they have done, as you all know. Now, this is actually a larger network than the actually use of the observations I'm going to mainly discuss, but it's what's sort of activity now. And in fact, there's serious talk about supplementing this with um, telescopes in space and particularly get, go, you can go to Greenland is, is one of the big, big, big baselines. You can't quite see it here, but Greenland will be very important. And so there's very ambitious plans to make this uh, an even bigger network, but it's uh, it's very exciting. And then um, this was uh, an image that was shown all around the world. It was a collab It was a product of a nearly a decade's work by the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration. Uh, and this is about a thousand people, not including me, but in including uh, many people from Europe. There was a strong European contingent uh, from Germany and Belgium, um, and uh, and it's you know it was a remarkable accomplishment to get all these different telescopes, um, all these different engineering systems, and so on, all these uh, different countries and agencies, and so on, all to work together towards a common goal. And the most challenging of all was realize you were working with astronomers; they all had to work together, and yet they did it, and they did something spectacular. They produced this image, which has been downloaded. Uh, as much as any scientific image over the last decade, I think. And it's sometimes called the shadow of a black hole. And so it's this ring and, you know, and the question is um, what in fact 
uh, are they observing? And of course, this has not been the only thing that's been going on in black holes. They've, uh, they've, re uh, they've recently become rather f even more famous. There have been two Nobel Prizes for, the, for LIGO and for following the stars around the uh, black hole, the four million solar mass black hole at the center of our galaxy. And then if you pay, dig a little deeper, you'll see an awful lot of uh, identification of black holes with gamma ray bursts, with the highest energy cosmic rays, which will be the topic of my fourth lecture, and PEV neutrinos, which will come up in my second lecture. So there's a, a, a lot going on with black holes now, and they've, uh, they've certainly got their place in the sun. Um, uh, not, not, uh, not every, there's no, there is some skepticism, uh, of course. Um, here's one, one image I, I, I rather like, um, saying what they were actually looking at. And then um, here's a, a cartoon uh, of the time, uh, a photo of a black hole. It took 23 years and $74 million, but we finally got it. So, but, uh, you know, for, for all, all of us, we are, well, the first time I saw this, I, I was really thrilled. And I think I speak for many of my colleagues and it was a, a fantastic, and I do know enough about this business to know what a tremendous technical accomplishment and how much hard work had to be done by so many people to pull this off. Anyway, so let me go back to the, the, the prime object of the Event Horizon Telescope. And this is just one of, as you should have got the message, there's, you know, there's a, a, a billion radio sources out there which are in, in one way or another similar to this that have actually seen with our telescopes. But this is the one that's up close and personal and the one we can look at. M87 is a giant elliptical galaxy. It's about uh, 10 trillion times the mass of the sun in total, including dark matter and so on. Um, here's a, a Hubble image here of the galaxy, and you'll see this jet coming out of. This was the first jet that was seen that, that was emitted by the center of the galaxy, and here's Curtis who found it. And then uh, this is in the middle of, the, of a giant cluster of galaxies, and the, we believe that the power that comes out of the nucleus of this galaxy carried by this jet keeps this hot gas hot and keeps it going. As we look with different telescopes at different wavelengths, we see uh, the jet on smaller and smaller scales. And as we go down from you know, the scale of the cluster of galaxies right down to the tiniest scale uh, size of the solar system, we see the, the image of, 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 the, of the shadow of the black hole. And um, uh, we know that the get, we're looking at something there. The fact that it's bright on one side uh, indicates it's in a ring. We know which way the gas swirls around the black hole. And that ring of gas is, um, is Doppler, is, the radiation from it is Doppler shifted towards us. And so it all sort of hangs together and the size is consistent with the size of the measured black hole, which was first measured in 1978 as 5 billion solar masses and is now argued to be closer to 6.5. So this is a pretty good effort. We observe all of this, as I say, through radio through gamma wave wavelengths. This image here is one that made a millimeter of wavelengths. We can use VLBI from space. I'll talk, say a bit more about this in the second lecture. Um, it has this environmental impact and it clearly in a very low state now, it's not a, not a very powerful source. In the past, it was probably brighter than Vega in the sky. So it was really a, a prodigious source in the past, but not now. So here's the EHT observations, just put a few numbers in here. I'm gonna do this rather fast. As I say, it's six and a half billion solar masses is the, the supposed mass of the black hole. So it all sort of fits more or less. This is the resolution of the telescopes. This is 50 micro arc seconds. That's a millionth of an arc second, micro arc second. Uh, the size of the black hole itself is four mic, the radius, the gravitational radius is four micro arc seconds equal to eight hours, 10 to the 15 centimeters and so on. And um, the spin energy is enormous. And I will, I mentioned that spin energy, that spin energy is good to keep the cluster going for a trillion years, much longer than the age of the universe. The image itself looks bigger than the black hole, which is one of the center because of the deflection of light by the gravitational field around the black hole. So this is what you expect to see is something bigger than this. And what you're actually looking at is almost everyone is agreed about this. It's synchrotron radiation. 
Um, 30 MeV electrons radiating in a roughly 100 Gauss field, and obviously there's a variation, making polarized synchrotron radiation. That's what you're looking at. So those are the observations. I now like to sort of um, jump back into theory, and I'm going to go into astrophysics rather than general relativity, and I'm going to contrast rotational power versus gravitational power. These massive black holes are associated not just with the rather feeble source in M87, they are associated with um, the mighty quasars, the gamma ray bursts, the things that are usually called the most luminous objects in the universe. They are prodigious power sources, although they're not that in this case. In other circumstances, they are. And so how do they actually supply the power? And there are two, um, two uh, sources of power that you can tap. And I'll call them nature and nurture, rotational power, which is the nature of the black hole itself, and nurture, which is feeding it with gas and letting it liberate its gravitational energy. Let's take the second of those first, because this is the more traditional one and the much more discussed one. Um, this is nurture. The gas is generally supposed, sorry, uh, to accrete, to flow inwards through an accretion disk, usually idealized as thin. And of course, all this is simulated now. And it goes inwards until it reaches an innermost stable circular orbit, at which point it plunges inward without any further dissipation. The energy that's released in getting down to that point can be anywhere between four, 10, 5 and 40 percent of the um, of these uh, four and forty percent, I should say, of the of the rest mass of the accreting gas, and is typically thought to be about ten percent as a practical matter. Um, and so that means you're releasing ten to the twenty ergs per gram, or a hundred MeV per nucleon, and so on. And this accretion disk is commonly uh, treated as being conservative in mass. That is, all the mass that's on the outside gets into the inside. The angular momentum is similarly conserved, and that necessarily produces a dissipation. Energy has to be released, and it is commonly presumed that that is radiated for the gratification of astronomers all around the universe. And so uh, these shine because the gas flows inwards, releasing its gravitational energy. Um, the disk, how it produces that is it obviously requires a, a friction between the differentially rotating gas in the disk. And that is naturally produced by magnetic field, which will grow fast through instability, um, which are well understood and simulated. And this is responsible for the dissipation and transporting the angular momentum. And you really transport a lot of energy outwards because any torque in this disk, which I've called G here, is going to do work at the rate of the product of the, of the um, torque and the angular velocity. And that work is, is energy that's carried outwards. And it's essentially the divergence of that energy that's carried outwards that is the... Um, uh, that is the source of the, 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 the radiation. By contrast, we have, if you like, the nature, which is that the, the, the source of the power is not the accreting gas. It's that the, the black holes, uh, they, can be, they are spun up naturally because if they've accreted gas in the past, um, if you've accreted gas in the past, then the black hole is going to spin faster and uh, faster because the angular momentum of the accreting gas is almost certainly, when it plunges, greater than the angular momentum per unit mass of the whole. And so it naturally spins it up to quite high values. And these high values have been measured by means I'm not going to discuss here. But there's a lot of evidence that the uh, spins of black holes are indeed very high and prograde with respect to the uh, uh, orbiting gas. So. Um, so you've got a spin energy, you can, the spin energy I say can be probably about 10% in practice, the same as per unit mass as that of the accreting gas. And it is thought that these black holes, and I'll say a little bit about this more today and much more in the second lecture, uh, are seen to be responsible for these famous jets, including the one in M87. But the question is how actually do you tap this spin energy? Before I try and address that, 
that question. Let me just say a little bit about how theorists, some of the different ways that theorists think about modeling the behavior of gas in the vicinity of a, of a spinning black hole. One of the approaches used is a sort of generalization of regular fluid mechanics. And just like people designing airfoils and so on, put a lot of effort into right, making codes that can be used reliably, the same sort of effort has gone in, on, into hydrodynamics in this, or fluid dynamics in this situation, but with the, <clears throat> the two important additional features that there's a strong magnetic field present, which makes it magnetohydrodynamics, and there's relativity uh, present, and which of course makes it a general relativistic problem, which people designing airfoils don't have to worry about. And so what you have here are the sort of fluid, fluid variables plus Maxwell's equations, and, um, and then there's usually either explicit or numerical dissipation, and it's possible to add in viscosity, resistivity, heat conduction, radiative transfer in this context is very important. All of these are additional things. And so you can produce uh, impressive uh, simulations. And here are just two out of countless current examples. Um, and some of them will, sh typically what they show is a very large torus of dense gas, which in this context of M87, not other sources, is supported by the pressure of 100 MeV or so ions. So you've got protons there with energies of about 100 MeV, mildly relativistic, and they provide the pressure, which makes a very thick, very round torus, a sort of giant donut, if you like, um, around the black hole. And that makes a funnel in the middle where the jets <coughs> are supposed to be escaped along this funnel. So here, uh, I'm not, <coughs> sorry, I'm not going to go through the, the details of what's in these simulations. Just, just understand that this is a well-developed interpretation of, of um, accretion more generally. And in particular, um, uh, a lot of simulations have been done for M87 in this sort of fluid style. And what one has is, of course, gas that is confining the, uh, the escaping jets. Now, another way of approach to this, which is being developed and has had a lot of interest and excitement, and here's um, a recent one that's been well publicized, is to take the sort of uh, uh, the plasma physics viewpoint and to recognize that we're not dealing with a fluid here. We're dealing with a, um, uh, electrons and positrons and protons and so on, and they're particles and they have a plasma physics and this was useful for understanding pair production, which is important in these sources. Um, and again, they've made uh, a lot of whoops, whoops, I'm going the wrong way. Uh, a lot of progress has been made in this, but it, it, there is a big difference in scales in that the Larmor or radii of these particles are typically like centimeters. So you're you're looking on a very small scale at a very large problem in this context. And the third approach is the one that I will actually develop more in the third lecture, uh, but I'll just introduce a little bit here loosely, um, is to use force-free electrodynamics. This is in fact the electrodynamics of Maxwell and, um, uh, and uh, essentially what it is is Maxwell's equations plus the purely electrodynamical equation of rho e plus j cross b. And Maxwell of course thought about currents and charges as a continuous fluid. He didn't, the particles and Lorentz force didn't come to till the 1890s. Actually, it was Heaviside who first thought about it in the 1880s. But for Maxwell, um, these were expressed just as continuous fluids. And it's a bit like an oceanographer thinking about a tsunami. Then they know water's made of water molecules, but that's not what they worry about. They regard it essentially as a continuous fluid. And one's doing the same thing here with the electromagnetic theory, just treating it as continuous distributions of charge and currents and the way electric engineer might. And uh, the plasma is there, of course, just to supply the currents, but there's no inertia, no pressure and so on. And this is a perfectly consistent system. It's a causal theory with characteristics and all the rest of it. Whichever of these approaches you use, and I'm going to use this force-free approach in this context, you eventually, if you want to say what, what you see, you've got to trace photons along null geodesics and parallel propagate the polarization. 
So how do you actually, I now try to answer the question of how do you extract the spin energy, not by the mechanism Roger Penrose proposed, which seems to be rather ineffectual, but instead to use large scale mag with magnetic fields, which you believe should be there. And here, uh, knowledge, uh, Michael Faraday. And of course, he said, that if you have a magnetic flux threading something that looks like a conductor, uh, then you'll make an EMF, a voltage, which is given by this formula here. And if we have some sort of electrical circuit there with an impedance, and the only impedance is the, under these relativistic circumstances, is that of free space, uh, which is twiddles 100 ohms, it works about 100 ohms typically, then um, you will, in this, in the case of uh, a, 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 active, a massive black hole, the voltage will be 10 exavolts, and that's 10 to the 19 volts, up to 10 to the 21 volts, a zeta volt. The corresponding um, currents are 100 times lower in SI units, and the power that you get, half of it essentially dissipated in the load, if you like, in a simple circuit, where particles are accelerated and photons are are radiated and half of it dissipated in internal resistance, which you'll never see again inside the area of the black hole. So that's typically what happens. But that power is anywhere between 10 to the 43 to 10 to the 47 ergs per second at the low end, good enough for M87, at the high end, good enough for the brightest quasars. Now, if you actually um, uh, consider stationary um, force-free electrodynamics, where you're just using Maxwell plus rho E plus J cross V, I saw a misprint there, vanishing. Uh, then one can define magnetic flux surfaces, as I've done here. So these are surfaces along which the magnetic field lines lie. And uh, if you consider this, just in the, in the simple case, here's the black hole here. So these field, field lines cross the surface of the black hole. And the, these flux surfaces, turns out, it's easy to show, are firstly equipotential. They've got the same electrostatic potential, if you like, and they're isorotational. So we think about these field lines as bits, flux surfaces rotating, because that's the frame in which the electric field vanishes. And furthermore, whoops, furthermore, the power, which is guaranteed to be conserved by symmetries in the problem, uh, and the angular momentum, the torque, if you like, they're both flow along these flux surfaces. So you're flowing along the flux surfaces. And so this is the uh, ex possible explanation for how jets are formed generically by black holes, essentially invisibly. You never saw them uh, in the EHT images. They're essentially invisible. It's just a, a, an elect electromagnetic pointing flux that uh, escapes along these flux surfaces and you take power out of the black hole. And it's really, um, a, a trick that's the same one that, that Penrose played in his process in the frame in which the energy and angular momentum were conserved, the non-rotating frame, if you like. Um, you take energy out of the black hole and that's what matters. If you were to hover above the black hole in a rotating frame, you would see energy going in, but angular momentum coming out. And it all works out in the, in the arithmetic. Okay, and here's a, just to show that here's an old simulation of this thing happening just to be respectable. In this case, the jet is confined by a, an orange torus of or, orbiting gas. And I like to call this the BMW mechanism because um, uh, all you require is magnetic field mass and angular velocity. And the, and the emblem of BMW has the uh, right, has the symmetry of the distribution of charge in this space time. But, so that's the sort of standard view. It's an old view. It goes back to 1977 and Ishimaru and so on. And I, I wrote papers and review articles and so on on this in the 1980s. So it's been around for a long time that there is this thick iron torus that confines the jets. And that's what we're, that, and it's that torus that um, the Event Horizon Telescope is observing. But I, I have been worried, in fact, it's the first time I saw the, uh, the image, um, and I, I'll sort of say what my three concerns are. The first is, why is the ring so dim? It's not that they see it, it's why isn't it much brighter? And it's a little pejorative, this here, and I think a, a reasonable discussion with other people would modify these numbers a little bit, but just to get your attention, let me say that the power in the jet seems to be about 10 to the 44 ergs per second. Some would say it's somewhat less than that, but let's just take those as round numbers just to make the point. 
the power that's observed from the ring at millimeter wavelengths is 10 to the 41 ergs per second, a thousand times smaller. So this jet is a mighty powerful thing compared with the radiation that we're seeing. The volume of the ring we know, we just measure it, is about 10 to the 48 cubic centimeters. So why is the ring so dim? It, this you've got here a, a gas orbiting, uh, exhibit, you know, potentially exhibiting all the um, instabilities known to man and plasma physicists, um, and yet it doesn't see, it wants to stop itself from radiating. Wherever else in astrophysics we see a flow like this, it's massively dissipative and radiative. So that's a big puzzle for me at any rate. The second question is where does the mass go? Measurements made at large radius, and I won't go through this, indicate at least that the rate of mass supply of bound matter bound to the black hole is about 10 to the 25 grams per second. Now, if we were to radiate this with the sort of efficiencies we've been talking about, 10 to the 20 ergs per gram, that would be 10 to the 45 ergs per second, and yet we're only seeing 10 to the 41, four orders of magnitude smaller. If it, it does seem a bit of a puzzle that, that there's the, in, the, the gas that we've any indication of is mostly lost before it gets down there. And then the question is, how does that mass actually um, become lost? And then the third question is, is, is what confines the jet? The pressure of the, of the hole in the jet, if you take some sort of jet power like this, is going to be about 10 to the fourth dynes per square centimeter. However, we can make an estimate of the electron pressure of the emitting particles. And that will be simply given by the, the power of millimeters times their cooling time, which we know in synchrotron radiation theory, divided by the volume of the ring. And that will be eight orders of magnitude smaller. So you're in, have, if you want to confine the jet by a pressure, an iron pressure, you've got to have a pressure that's orders and orders of magnitude larger than the gas that you're looking at. And furthermore, there's a complication here is it looks observationally that when we look at those images, um, the, uh, the jet is confined on a, on, a, on a larger scale. So you need something, not just the torus, to provide that collimation. So with that in mind, I'm now presenting uh, a, an alternative view, if you like, um, uh, and uh, a much less well-developed one than the standard view that there's a torus that's confining the jet and is being observed by, by uh, the Event Horizon Telescope. And instead, I'm just going to sketch it in outline here, is that if you take the view, which I think more and more people do, is that most of the gas supplied in the systems becomes bound to the black hole, but does, um, uh, but, does not, um, but does not make it down to the black hole, then it has to be driven away. It has to be driven to escape from a, from a bound orbit. That needs power. It can't do it with the zero energy that it started off with. It has to get some additional power. It's just like the sun, which in order to be kept going for as long as it appeared to have shone, you know, the dawn of nuclear physics and so on, needed an additional source of power. And so, and furthermore, you have to apply this power sufficiently far from the black hole that whatever power you have could drive the gas away. So that's a sort of lower bound on the radius at which you eject the gas from. And and it seems very strange that you would do this close to the back hole and you'd have all these things happening and yet be done in a completely invisible, non dissipative way. This differentially rotating magnetized gas would be radiating like crazy. And the disparity, as I say, is only 10 to the 41 grams per second. So you, the only source, credible source of power is the, um, uh, is the spin of the black hole. It's the only accessible thing that seems to be left there in the system unless you want to violate energy conservation. And we know that this seems to be supplying 10 to the 44 ergs per second for the jets. So it's, if, it, if a, a comparable amount of power went into, the, uh, went into the accreting gas, then it could drive it off from say a thousand um, gravitational radii. And so that's the contention here. That's the line of argument, if you like, that I'm following with my, uh, my colleague here, um, 
uh, Noemi Globus, who I've work, been working with on this problem. And so the idea is that you e eject the gas from so roughly a thousand gravitational radii and the accretion disk, which I sh show here, where the a large radius, the gas is just flowing inwards, become, to use another Latin construct, an ejection disk. It's an ejection disk and the gas that is now a, a, a fast 10 to 25 grams per second up here becomes essentially zero at the, in, at the inner edge of this ejection disk. And it's driven off as a hydromagnetic wind that is responsible for the observed collimation of the jets. And I'll have more to say about this in the second lecture. Now, so this is the general idea. We've got a jet that's made um, and described by force-free electrodynamics, general relativistic force-free electrodynamics, um, close to the black hole. And that's a ready source of power. And then, and then we want to drive the gas away from the ejection disk. We've got to have some clutch, some connection, mechanical connection between the spin of the black hole and the ejection disk. And this is the, the part that we've been thinking about, the ways in which this might happen. And I don't have any good store, well-developed story to tell you, just a few um, notions that we've been working hard on trying to understand. And here's a sort of another cartoon that Naomi Glovis and I have been, whoops, sorry, thinking about. Um, and here, um, this is sort of looking, these scales are not, this is not really, to, I don't know whether this is radius or log radius here. This is just schematic. But here we have the black hole itself on the small scale. We have magnetic field lines that thread the black hole that are powering the jet with power L and torque energy and angular momentum, if you like, that are essentially carried off more or less along the magnetic surfaces as I described. Out here, we have a hydromagnetic wind that is taking the gas from the accretion disk and driving it off and ultimately collimating this jet in the manner that is observed and there's a shear layer which is responsible for the emission and so on. And then in between, there's this electromagnetic clutch this, ele this electromagnetic clutch has got to transport energy, not just along the field lines, but across the field lines going outwards in the equatorial direction so that energy in particular, but also angular momentum, but it's mainly energy that matters, goes from the spin of the black hole to this ejection disk where it can then drive away all the accreting gas by having this rapid spinner in the middle. Now, how would it affect this? The contention is, and this is only a conjecture at this point, is that there are instabilities rather similar in character to those that are um, known to operate in accretion disks, just tapping the differential rotation, that essentially, even in the force-free approximation, take energy and angular momentum, take and couple one field line to the next and drive this energy and ang angular momentum outwards. It's a little, little bit like Kuwait flow for those who know fluid mechanics. Now, this has got to be done, we think, uh, in a region that is causally connected between the black hole. We're in the subsonic part of the flow. There are many signal speeds, but this does have a meaning. We're in the subsonic part of the flow. So this is all coupled and connected. So this is the sort of outline of the scheme. Uh, up here, of course, the flow is supersonic, and there's no way of getting that part to talk to that part there if it's gone supersonic. But in this part, you can, and you can get energy and angular momentum transported outwards. So this is the scheme. It has rather strong observational implications, as you might imagine. And it's posing a lot of interesting physics problems, which we and I'm sure others are, are thinking about. Um, and, and in particular, those that happen, what's going on inside this magnetosphere, which is now an ergo magnetosphere because the magnetic fields are much more important than gravity in some sense in this region. And uh, so the magnetic fields are telling particles what to do there. And we have some there's interesting questions which we're thinking about. Um, but at any rate, this is the story so far. And this is as far as I think I should responsibly take it in, in a physics colloquium, unless there are uh, talks beyond it. So let me just finish now with my summary. Um, this is, if you like, the sort of central ideas. Black holes, I hope I persuade you, are common. I should have also had it perhaps and famous. Um, and everything we have seen from all of these observational investigations has corroborated general relativity. There's nothing out there that has one scratching one head 
the Event Horizon Telescope didn't find a, a pentagram three times the size of the that was indicated at the center of their image. They, they found something that really did look like the shadow of a black hole of the right size. Black holes are simple, they're simpler than the electrons. They only have mass and spin. They don't have uh, they don't have charge. They could do, but in astrophysics, they don't have charge. Um, and they uh, and they they can either power their sources, and of course, both of these happen in different types of sources. I'm just focusing on M87 here. They power either through nature, which is ro uh, rotation, their nature, or through nurture, which is the gravitational energy of the accreting gas. I hope I've given what I've told you what you already know is the event arising telescope observations were a magnificent achievement and we should celebrate them. Uh, and we could be observing either an iron torus or this ergo magnetosphere electromagnetic clutch e ejection disk combination, which is the one that I personally favor and my, my colleagues favor, favor and uh, I'm uh, trying to explore in a bit more detail. So thank you and keep well. well thank you. Thank you for uh, this wonderful talk. So now we have time for questions. So people should speak up if they have a question. Hmm? Maybe I can start if I don't. So should, I Mark, should I remove my screen? Do you want to see my face or my view graphs? Uh, maybe you can remove the screen, but at some point we might need it back depending on the questions. Okay, all right, I'll remove it now then. Yeah, then it's, so it's easier to see people who have questions. So I see a question from uh, Leonard Bircher. So maybe you can start. Yes, uh, thank you very much for this talk. Uh, very uh, in interesting. I, I work on the AGN Taurus, so that's a little bit larger out. And, and there, um, it is typically assumed that while the accretion on scales of like 10 parsecs um, is, is huge, something like a, many solar masses per year, what essentially then reaches the inner edge of the torus, so let's say the outer edge of the accretion disk, is, is much, much less. And you said some time half in your talk that the assumption for the accretion disk is that all the mass gets accreted toward the black hole. And I was just wondering if you could uh, tell how realistic this uh, assumption is. Oh, th th thank you very much, Leonard, uh, for your question. Let me let me clarify that. What I, what I was I was taking, if you like, two extreme sort of simple versions of accretion, and the sort of classical theory of accretion disk going back to the nineteen fifties, and then sort of redeveloped and extended in by Shakur and Sanyaev and many others <clears throat> in the seventies essentially deals with conservative flow of mass and angular momentum. That, that, is, that is just as if you like a paradigm, if you like. Now, um, if you cannot radiate away the, um, the, en the energy efficiently, then you're, this is a point that, that, that actually Mitch, Mitch Beagleman and I made in papers in the 90s, um, you're you essentially have to carry it away and almost certainly in a wind. So mass loss is almost inevitable if you cannot radiate efficiently. And so, you know, the, the more sophisticated theory rather than the paradigmatic um, extremes is, um, uh, you know, is a sort of half, a bit of a halfway house. So I think most people who are thinking about M87, the galactic center and so on, acknowledge that the mass supply at large radius is orders and orders of magnitude smaller than they get at small radius. But there really is a problem is you've got to have a power source to drive it away. And you can, uh, you, 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 can, you can live off the energy at much smaller radius and keep on going down to smaller radius, but then you're worrying why you aren't, in the case of M87, you aren't seeing it. In the case of a quasar or a CIFA galaxy, those are luminous, really luminous objects. They've got, you know, paths that are comparable with some significant fraction of the energy limit. They are radiating efficiently. Gas must be getting to small radius and doing it. So they're re really rather different beasts. Here I'm talking about the low path, lower, lower power from the point of view of um, optical astronomy, say, or uh, radio galaxies. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, there is a 
question from Yan Liu. So go ahead, please. Yes, uh, I want to ask uh, uh, for the negative energy. There's a logosphere, and uh, what if uh, a particle that with uh, negative energy and uh, he is uh, outgoing? What will it happen uh, when it touch to the logosphere, or uh, or it met, uh, doesn't exist uh, this kind of orbit? Sorry, um, I'm. There's a word that you used twice that I could not hear. Uh, the ergosphere. The no, ergo something energy, something energy, the something energy. No, negative energy. Ne negative, negative, sorry, yeah, that's it, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, fantastic, yes. Yes, I hear it now, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, basically, uh, okay, um, if you know what a killing vector is, then the killing vector that's associated with energy at infinity is a time-like killing vector. And it's, it's a time-like vector at, outside the ergosphere. But when you get inside the ergosphere, it becomes space-like. And the conserved quantity for a particle on a, on a geodesic is the inner product of the momentum and the killing vector. Yeah. So if it's space-like, that means it can change sign. It doesn't mean it always does that. It just means it has the opportunity to do that. Mm. And so that's fundamentally why Penrose said, look, there are negative energy orbits inside the ergosphere. They'll never okay. get out. They can't propagate outside the ergosphere because outside the ergosphere, you've got a time-like killing vector. So, so that means that if they go into the black hole and they're on one of these orbits, a minority of them for sure, that are negative energy, then they will decrease the actual mass as measured by a distant planet of the black hole. The area must increase, but the mass can decrease. Okay. okay. So that's how you, that's how you extract, extract the energy through this process. Now, the way of doing this at the level of a thought experiment is to have an engineer there, um, you know, directing traffic. Um, but uh, you can also t take out something that's slightly more realistic, which is having a couple of particles that are uh, sent in from with appropriate energy and angular momentum from large distance, and then they collide elastically in the ergosphere, one goes into the black hole in a negative energy orbit, the other escapes to infinity with more energy than the rest masses of the particles you started off with. Energy is conserved in that sense. Mm. It's not practical and most of us believe that, although it's a nice thought experiment, it doesn't happen naturally in, with any efficiency. Just one little point, the one, one of the sort of quick and dirty ways of describing Hawking radiation plays the same game in a Schwarzschild black hole where right up to the event horizon, you've got a time-like killing vector, but as soon as you cross the event horizon, that same killing vector becomes negative. So you might, for example, have the electron and positron in a fuzzy quantum mechanical way on either side of the event horizon. One is on a, one will have negative energy, the other will have positive energy, and the one with positive energy outside the horizon can escape whether the other one goes into the hole. So that's a sort of quick and dirty um, version of Hawking radiation, relying on, on, on somewhat similar principles. Okay, there is a question now by uh, Peter. Thank you. Piano. So Peter. Yeah. Uh, hi, Roger. Uh, hi. I actually have two questions. Eh? So one is, uh, I got a bit confused towards the end. Uh, during the disk accretion, what actually happens to the spin of the black hole? Does it grow or decrease? If you extract some energy from the rotation, logically, it sort of uh, should decrease. Absolutely. But how do you get this spin in there in the first place? Eh? Okay, two questions then. The first question is, if you want to Generically, if you want to take energy out of a black hole, you're going to have to spin it down. But how do you spin it up? It's the same. Oh, that, that, that's no. in an earlier phase. Remember, we've got a six billion solar mass black hole there. 
unless well, it came from the dawn of time, it, it grew by accretion. Six by the same years. accretion, Rose, in the old... Yes, 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 no, no, but, but that's in a different type of accretion. There ah, you okay. have the quasar. It was a quasar. I, I'll bet you anything that M87 in the past was a quasar and um, would be enormously powerful, 10 to the 48 ergs per second or thereabouts. And as I say, it would be brighter than Vega in the night sky at that time. It would be the, almost the brightest thing in the sky. So I mean, you need to be around. It wouldn't have been around that time. That would have been a billion, you know, three billion years ago or whatever, a long, long time ago. But uh, and and then the key thing is, if you have gas that essentially is getting all the way down to the event horizon, as it will. When there's so much mass that's supplied, I think the, you can't stop it. It must get down to the event horizon. It will radiate like crazy. But it um, wouldn't be disk accretion. No, it would be different kind of. Well, it would be disk. It's got angular momentum. It's trying hard to get rid of. And so it will be disk accretion. It, it may be thin disk. It, it, I mean, there's, you know, there's, there's different views on this, but most of us would say if it's mo modest, you know, critical accretion rates, it will be a thin disk. If it's a larger accretion rates, it will be a very thick radiation supported disk, like a, you know, like another one of these giant toruses, but where the pressure comes from radiation, not ions. Either way, um, the angular momentum of the gas that you can't stop from joining the black hole and causing it to grow in mass will be greater than the specific angular momentum of the black hole. It must spin up. There were these famous calculations from Kip Thorne in the uh, early 1970s where he, he did a sort of very stylized problem and said there was a, a limiting value of A, which I said had to be less than one. It was 0.998 in that calculation. And it happened rather quickly because the, you know, you accrete angular momentum faster than you accrete mass. But then this, this, this brings me to the second question. The second question is how do you make uh, the angular momentum of the gas, which is accreting aligned to the angular momentum of the black hole? Or is it, is it not always the case or what actually happens? So. Again, a, a, a lovely question, a, long, a longer answer. Um, the, um, it may be the other way around. If you've got a permanent source of angular momentum in the disk, a permanent direction of angular momentum as the black hole grows, it will become aligned with the disk if that's where most of the angular momentum is when you start off with. Because remember, this black holes are small, so there's not a lot of specific angular momentum there. It's, it's all at large radius in an accretion disk. So it could be it happens that way. The other thing that happens is through relativistic effects, there's a, so essentially a differential precession of the of rings of gas and within a radius that's known usually as the bardeen petterson radius, you expect accreting oblique gas to be dragged into the equatorial plane of a spinning black hole. And so close enough to the black hole, when you're, in, when you're having a lot of flow of mass into the black hole, in this sort of high mass supply rate case, if you like, in that case, you'll get, um, you'll get the gas dragged into the equatorial plane of the black hole. And so the, um, the power should be, the jet should be initially parallel to the um, spin of the black hole, but then twisted to be uh, uh, along the direction of the angular momentum of the gas at larger radius. So there's some transition, usually it's estimated to be somewhere between 100 and 1000 gravitational radii, this bardeen petterson radius. Does one actually see these misaligned cases? Yeah, well, um, there are good examples in the observations of um, processing jets and aligning jets. Both of those have been claimed observationally, the most famous by far. But here the interpretation is, um, there are many interpretations, let's say, is the galactic source, which I will show briefly on uh, in, in the next lecture called SS433, which has been known since 1979. And that has two jets from a galactic stellar type black hole that process on a cone with a 20 degree opening angle um, every 163 days. Okay. And some people associate that with relativistic effects, others do not. 
Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Okay, maybe we have one last question by uh, Geoffrey. So you can go ahead. Hello, um, thank you a lot for your talk. So I have more a theory question on, uh, on ergo spheres. Uh, so is it known what would be the, the configuration of the, of the magnetic spheres so that the efficiency of extraction of the rotational energy of the black hole would be the most, would be maximal, would be the most efficient in the same way that for the for heat engine, there is a Carnot um, theorem saying what would be the maximal efficiency you could have. Um, and is nature close to the maximal efficiency? So that's, that's a, 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 again, a, a, a lovely question. Um, let's give up on the electromagnetic fields for the moment and ask um, about you know pop, things that were understood in the 1960s by Krista Dulu and others. Um, basically, the thermodynamic analogy has has turned out to be even has turned out to be even less of an analogy and more of a reality uh, than um, than people originally thought, appreciated. Um, and the, the investigations in the essentially in in the nineteen late nineteen sixties uh, showed that um, if you threw rocks into a black hole with just the right ratio of energy to angular momentum, it's essentially the ratio is omega, if you just threw them in the right way, then that was essentially a reversible process, rather like the Carnot cycle. So if you had a bunch of engineers there who were rotating just above the black hole and throwing rocks in at just the right ratios of energy and angular momentum, then that's essentially a reversible process. So you would say it's 100 percent with respect to the bound you show yes. the energy. Even with magnetospheres, you could reach 100 percent. No, uh, I, I said let's forget the magnetic field for a moment. Let's just have the rocks. And so with rocks are easier to understand. Um, now, if you ask in practice, it would be no closer to the Carnot cycle. Um, it would be no closer to a reversible process in your refrigerator is to the Carnot cycle. It would, you know, it will have all sorts of real world inefficiencies like an automobile or so on and um uh so in practice if you get 50 percent efficiency that would be remarkable in the you know these circumstances now with electromagnetic fields it is it's hard to get even close to reversible and the reason why is that there's an unavoidable dissipation behind the behind the curtain behind the event horizon and that uh, one way to think about this is to try and explain this to radio astronomers because radio astronomy is their language. In some sense, you can associate a resistivity or a surface conductivity with the event horizon. Now, others have taken this into a much more formal route, which is of some considerable interest in theoretical physics, particularly you know, quantum gravity and so on, um, and, it, and added viscosity and other types of dissipation there. But you can, but the sim most simple minded way, there's essentially 100 ohms of resistance associated with the horizon, and you can't get rid of that. So for that reason, it's hard to do something that's electromagnetically reversible, but it's not hard to do something that is 50% efficient. Okay, so there seems to be a theoretical bound due to this resistivity. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, there are contrivances for getting around that, but in any sort of, you know, responsible okay. thought experiment, it it's, it's can be rather, in if you're going to have some dissipation inside the hole, so you'll never get all of the spin energy out, but if you get half of it, as I say, that's enough to keep the Virgo cluster warm and toasty for, for, 100, for 100 or maybe 1,000 Hubble times. Thank you, thank you. Okay, maybe a related question. Um, so in order to solve the differential equations in the vicinity of the black hole, how do you treat the horizon? You have to put boundary conditions on the horizon? Is it the way you, and if so, what type of boundary conditions do you put? Uh, again, a, a lovely question. Um, the two ways of answering this, it depends really on the choice of coordinate system you use, what you do. Um, there's the, the boundary condition um, 
uh, that is appropriate to the horizon um, if you regard it as a formal boundary condition. It's really a, lim a limiting process. Was that one actually that was uh, derived by my collaborator on working on this Romans Nyack um, in in the in the 1970s, and he, he actually wrote down uh, a formal version of, of of the boundary conditions and uh, the uh, in. You know, one way of thinking about this is if you work in the frame of an infalling observer rather than something like rather than the, the coordinate system that goes singular at the horizon, you just ask, well, what will an in you know um, uh, an infalling observer measure? Then you want the infall you want their electromagnet electric and magnetic fields to be uh, non singular. You just want them to be smoothly varying. And that turns out to be sufficient uh, for defining the coordinate system in the in say in your original Bo Boa Lindquist, for example, coordinate system. So that's that's the way of doing that. Um, the way I, I personally think about it now, which I think is more instructive, is just is to change to a different coordinate system, one that actually it doesn't go it does the opposite of what these infalling coordinate systems does it 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 takes the um horizon and, and it, it 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 sends that off to negative infinity so you essentially make that a you make that infinitely far away and then just as a you know a, a somebody designing a, a rate electrical engineer designing an antenna would 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 think about Sommerfeld radiation conditions as you send electromagnetic waves and have nothing coming back again, and you can formalize that. You can do the same thing here using this sort of coordinate transformation. So in this sense, it's the, it's the um, uh, anti-Penrose diagram view, if you like, of relativity. You know, Something like Dr. Roger Penrose's yeah. Penrose diagrams brought in infinity into a front of the same piece of paper. And I'm doing I'm taking something that is on the same piece of paper and sending it out to infinity. So that's the way I would look at it now, but that's mainly for technical reasons, not for any sort of conceptual reason. But so it would be something like the tortoise coordinate or something like that that pushes. Yeah, yeah right it, it, is, it is rather similar to that in the sense that it's logarithmic, but it's uh, but it's obviously for a rotating metric. Okay. Mm -hmm. It, it, it's done, I'm sure you, you know a lot about these things, but uh, okay. the, uh, well, Zamo, Zamo, Zamo frame, yeah. You, you, you work in the Zamo frame and then you make a transformation of the radial coordinate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, if there is no other question, let's thank Roger again. So, well, a big clap. Thank you very much. Thank you and, for uh, listening. Thank you. And uh, the next lecture then is on uh, Monday. Same time for us, but one hour uh, uh, later, I think, for you, Roger. Yes. Okay. yes. And that will be about uh, relativistic jets. Okay. Thank you very well, much. Thank you again, and uh, goodbye to everyone. See you next week. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you, Roger. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye.